Andrew Womack Ministries presents this session from the 2015 Ontario Gospel Truth Rally. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 1. And tonight I just want to share some <clears throat> real simple things with you. I don't know anything that's real complicated. It's just real simple stuff. But sometimes people... I had somebody come up tonight. I was visiting with some of our partners before the meeting and somebody was talking about how I just made it so simple and that that's what really blessed them. And I told them, I said, that's because I am so simple. You know what? I don't know any real complicated stuff, but boy, what I know is working. And I think sometimes people just make the gospel too simple, I mean, too hard. And the truth is, it's not the real gospel. The real gospel is just real simple. But religion has complicated things. I'm going to share some really simple things with you here in Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> I hesitate to read all of these verses because, man, I've preached an hour on each one of these verses. I want to get down to verse 4. So let me just, let's go to verse 3. It says, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter one says, grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. Most people pray for things like this. They pray for grace. They pray, pray for peace. I had a couple of people tonight ask me, would you please pray that this would happen and pray that that would happen? And I said, no, you don't need prayer. What you need is just knowledge. You need to get into the word of God and renew your mind. And there's people that are praying, like for instance, for healing. And they're asking God to heal them. The Bible says that God's word is health unto all of your flesh and life unto them that find it. In Proverbs chapter four, verses 20 through 22. And it says in Psalms 107, verse 20, that God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. Matthew chapter eight, a man who said, I don't need you to come touch me. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith. The greatest faith, the best way to receive from God is just to take the truth of God's word and it will change you. It will set you free. And yet the average person does not take that approach. Instead, they want somebody to come wave their hand over you. They're praying for God to send revival. They're wanting a glory cloud to descend. They're wanting all these other things. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God does use those things. It's because he loves you so much. If the only way that the Lord had that you could receive was just to totally get your mind renewed and stand in the word, there would be a lot of people dying and not receiving because they aren't that serious about God and they aren't seeking God that way. And so you can receive through these special gifts and I am not discrediting that. There's a place for all of it. It's not one or the other, but I'm telling you that you can't count on somebody with a special anointing around to always bail you out. You can count on the word of God to always put you over. And we are specifically trying to redirect people's attention away from receiving from God from the outside and instead start receiving what God has already given you. So this is what this is saying. Grace and peace over in 2 Peter chapter 1 is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. If you don't have peace, if you don't have grace, you don't have the right knowledge. We've got the wrong knowledge. We've got to get our thinking straightened out. And in verse 4, it says, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. God's will for you is to be delivered from this present evil world. And again, the church has basically, uh, you know, interpreted this, translated it to say that it's all when we get to heaven. What a day that's going to be. And it's going to be awesome. And we talk about how wonderful heaven is. And heaven is going to be wonderful. But this says he gave himself to deliver us from this present evil world. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven to begin to experience the blessing and the power of God. Jesus said in the model prayer, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants you to be walking in absolute, total victory now. 
And did you know that the most opposition against that will come from the church? The church have become masters of explaining away why you can't walk in victory. They will tell you that God's the one who's putting these problems in your life. God made you sick to teach you something. This is God's punishment. God's not answering your prayer because you haven't fasted enough or prayed enough or whatever. And those things are not true. Jesus wants you delivered from this present evil world. He wants you to be living as it is in heaven to be here on earth. That's what he told us to pray. God wants you well. <laughs> Excuse me. He wants you well. He wants you healed. He wants you prosperous. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have a purpose for your life. And yet, it's amazing to me how many Christians don't have this. Why is that? And I've already kind of teased this, but what I'm going to try and get across tonight is most Christians are praying and asking these things to come as if they are yet to be accomplished. And the truth is God has already done everything. The Bible says Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. He is not there working. He is not healing people. He's not setting people free. Jesus accomplished everything 2,000 years ago. And there's many scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes we were healed. God isn't healing people tonight. He healed you 2,000 years ago. And that healing isn't out there somewhere that you've got to pray it down or have God stretch forth his hand. God placed the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of every single one of you who've been born again. And the things that we're praying for and asking God to do, he's already done. You've already got it. And somebody's saying, well, no, I don't have it. That's because here's the, here's the real crux of the matter that we are, I'm trying to say this nice, but I don't know a nice way to say this. We are carnal. You know, the word carnal to some people just means that you're terrible, you're sinful, it's like a terrible person. The word carnal just means of the five senses. Matter of fact, the word carnal comes from a word carne in the Greek, and that's where we get chili con carne, chili with meat. That's what it's talking about. The word carne, carne means meat. And if you look it up in Strong's uh, dictionary, it just means the flesh as stripped of skin. In other words, not your epidermis, not the skin that you see, but the meat below the skin. That's what the word carne is referring to. And so when it talks about that you're carnal minded, it's saying you're a meathead. <laughs> Amen. But really carnal just means that you are going, you are controlled, dominated by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And this is the problem. The Bible says that we have already overcome, that we already have the same power on the inside of us that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter one, verse 18. He says, the same things that I do shall you do also. And I could just go through and quote verse after verse after verse. Most of you in here know that there's more scriptures about victory, prosperity, joy, peace, healing, anointing than what you're experiencing. But the average person can't see those things come to pass because they're looking for them in the physical. When I say that God has already healed you and that he's already done everything, you immediately check your body to see if you got pain, to see if the lump is gone, to see if your eyes can see. And you're looking for this power of God in the physical realm. But I'm telling you, God is a spirit. John 4, 24 and God placed this power in your born again spirit, not in your physical body, not in your soulish realm. Now it's in you because it's in your spirit, but I'm saying you can't discern the power of God by just feelings and things like this. You know, I'm amazed how many times people will, will be sitting here praising the Lord and talking about the goodness of God and all of these things. And then right in the middle of all of this, in praise and worship, somebody will go to begging God to come. Oh God, we welcome you. We want your power to come. Just bring your power. And I'm, it just aggravates me when they do that because the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he's always with us. We'll pray these prayers. God, go with us as we leave this place. 
How's God going to answer a prayer like that when he says that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you? And people say, oh, well, I know, I, I know that he said that, but, and what you're saying is, I don't feel it. I don't see it. And because you don't feel it, because no glory cloud has manifested, because you don't have a goosebump going up and down your spine, you wonder if God is here. The truth is God is here and he's not only here in this building and among us, but he's inside of every one of you and his fullness, uh, uh, of his fullness have all we received. John chapter one, verse 16. God is in you in all of his strength and in all of his power. And the average Christian will not receive that because they don't feel it. When I say that you're anointed, most people, well, I don't feel anything. Anointing has nothing to do with what you feel. God has placed his power on the inside of you. And just like this verse is saying, he has already, his will is for you to be delivered from this present evil world. And everything that it takes for you to live in absolute total victory, God has already placed on the inside of you. And the only thing that is keeping it from manifesting is not you praying hard, harder, not you living holier or anything. It's based on knowledge. It says, oh, let me turn over to these verses. I quoted them earlier, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, it's saying the same thing. This is said many places. Man, uh, Philemon chapter one, verse six is one of my favorite scriptures. This verse changed my life. But he prayed a prayer and he said, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The way your faith begins to work is when you start acknowledging what's already in you, not when you pray for God to descend and pray for the power of God to be poured out, but when you start acknowledging what he's already done. God has already placed his power on the inside of you. And here in 2 Peter chapter one, I already used verse two where it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And in verse three it says, according as his divine power hath given unto us, uh, all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. This says everything that pertains unto life and godliness. What does that include? Everything. Do you need to be healed tonight? That would fall into this category. Do you need to have joy tonight? That would fall into this category. Do you need prosperity? Do you need direction? Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given unto you through the knowledge of him that has called you to glory and virtue. If you have a deficiency in any area of your life, you've got a knowledge problem. Thank you for that thunderous silence. Again, most people don't believe this. If you believed it, you would be renewing your mind as fast as you possibly can. If it's not a matter of trying to get God to move and God to pour out his spirit and oh God, send revival. Revival's not dependent upon God. Revival is dependent upon you learning what you have in Christ and walking in it. If you find out that you've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead and he said, you go do the same works and even greater works than I did, you go out and raise a few people from the dead and you'll have all the revival that you can handle. Amen. It's not up to God to send revival and yet the church is praying, oh God, pour out your spirit. God poured out his spirit. It's inside of you. His power is living on the inside of you. But again, most of us don't believe this because we don't feel it. We go look in the mirror and we think this, is, this couldn't be all there is. That's because you're looking in the flesh. You can't see your spirit. You can't see what it's like. But I'm telling you, in your spirit, you're awesome. If you're born again, you're already everything that you will ever be in your spirit. And as quickly as you can renew your mind to it, you can experience life here on earth as it is in heaven. You can experience being delivered from this present evil world. God has already done his part, but he needs us to understand and renew our minds to this. And this is what this is saying. Everything 
that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him. And then the next verse says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this knowledge that he was talking about in verse three is given to us through exceeding great and precious promises. That's talking about the word of God. The word of God contains the knowledge of God. It tells us what we need to know. You know, I was talking to our students today and there was a question that came up. And anyway, basically I was just telling them that you know what, uh, there was a time when I was so frustrated because God showed me where he wanted my life to go and where I was was so far from where God was telling me to go that it was just like I was overwhelmed. God, how could I ever get there? How can I cover this distance? And as uh, I was praying about this, I was kneeling around my bed and I had my Bible open on my bed and I just opened up my eyes. I was saying, God, how do I get from where I am to where I need to go? And I opened my eyes and I saw my Bible laying on my bed. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, if you'll stick your nose in this book and learn this stuff, it'll teach you everything you need to know. And I just took that as a directive. And I mean, I started pouring into the word of God. I started renewing my mind day and night. And I can truthfully tell you that right now, I'm not trying to get God to do anything. I am just walking with God and God is downloading things and showing me what he wants me to do. And it's, it's miraculous. I was telling our students today that the guy who produces all of Disney's 3D animations and stuff like this, he just happened to get changed through our ministry and he resigned working with Disney and producing all of their things and came. And I'm in a process of doing something and a couple of days ago he walked in and he says, God sent me here to help you. I couldn't pay this guy. I mean, it'd be hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay this guy something. And he just gave up and gave it all up and walked in and now he's helping us do these things. God is just putting stuff together. I'm not asking God, to, oh God, please do this. You just renew your mind and I guarantee you it's, well, I've got a teaching entitled Effortless Change. You change effortlessly if you get in and renew your mind, the word of God will transform you. Your life is going the direction that it's going because of your thoughts. If you don't like the direction of your life, change your thoughts. But most people won't change their thoughts. They will change their prayers. They will beg God a little harder. They will try and act a little better and they'll do all of this. But very few people will get in and renew their mind. I'm telling you, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is the way that it is because of the way your thoughts are. Yep, that usually goes over about like that. <laughs> Our society's become masters at blaming everybody else. No, you don't understand. I was abused when I was a child. I was sexually assaulted. assaulted. I was raised poor. I had this happen. And we blame other things. I'm telling you, you can take people that have been through identical things that you've been through, and instead of being defeated and bitter and angry, they are just prosperous. And it's not, it's not because of the circumstances. I'm not saying circumstances aren't a factor, but the Bible teaches that you are the way you are because of the way you think. Isaiah chapter 26, verse three says, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusted in him. If you aren't in perfect peace, if you're depressed, if you're discouraged, if you're beat down, it is not because of what's happened to you, it's because of the way you think about what has happened to you. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. We love to blame other people and say, no, it's somebody else's fault that I'm the jerk that I am, but it's your fault. You've had things happen, but it's the way you think about it. It's the fact that you focus upon it. And it's the fact that most of us are just carnal. We're looking on the outside. And when God says that you are a victor instead of a victim, we say, oh no, God. And we look at the things we've been taught that somehow or another you're in denial. If you don't sit here and fall apart like a $2 suitcase when things come your way, you, 
You just are in denial. That's not true. I'm not denying that there's problems in my life, but I am denying that what I see, taste, hear, smell, and feel is all that there is. I am a new person in Christ. There is a spirit on the inside of me, and in this spirit, I've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I've got the mind of Christ. I've got a supernatural anointing from God. And I just refuse to live like a mere human being. There's a lot of people that will say, well, you are just a human being. No, I am a human being, but I am not only a human being. I've got one third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. And we just aren't using what we've got. I tell you, I just feel like the Lord, people are upset at God. Like, God, you could have changed this. You could have healed this person. You could have made my business work. You could have made all of these things happen. That's not true. God has all power, but he gave it to us. He gave us authority. In James chapter four, verse seven, it says, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil will flee from you. You can't ask God to rebuke the devil. You can't ask God, no, please get the devil off my back. God said, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. If Satan is beating you up, it's because you aren't resisting, because you have bought into a lie that somehow or another Satan is superior and that Satan is stronger than you are. That's not true. It's because of the way you think. If you understood how powerful what God gave you is and that the authority that you've got, I guarantee you, you could drive the devil out of your life and out of your situations and you could be walking in victory. It's our lack of understanding that's causing the problem. You ever seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, you know, what you don't know won't hurt you? Well, I guarantee you, that's a lie. What you don't know is killing you. God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. Brothers and sisters, we got to renew our mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This isn't just for the preachers. This isn't just for the super saints. This is your reasonable service. Jesus died for us. The least we could do is live for him and make a commitment to turn our lives over to him. And so it's just your reasonable service. And then verse two says, and don't be conformed to this world. The word conform there in the Greek means to pour into the mold. Don't let the world pour you into their mold. Don't let them force your thinking to be like them. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The way you get transformed is to renew your mind, to change your way of thinking. And again, the church doesn't believe this. They say, oh no, the way you get transformed is to fast and to pray and to do all of these things and live holy and quit doing this. If you don't, if you know, you gotta quit your drinking, you gotta quit this, you gotta quit this. And basically it's based on performance and all of this stuff. The scripture makes it very clear that you get transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the way you think, and that's how you prove the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. You know, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir. This is Friday night, and y'all are the ones who are out here listening to me preach instead of home watching as the stomach turns on the television. <laughs> and so I know that you have a desire for this, but I'm telling you that this is what we've got to do is we've got to get our mind renewed, and we've got to recognize that everything that God gives us is in the spiritual realm. You can't just go look in a mirror and God says you can do these things. You can't see it in the mirror. You can't feel it based on just your feelings. You have to take the word of God and use this as a way of seeing into who you are in Christ. This is like a spiritual mirror. If you want to see if your hair is combed, you have to go look in a mirror. You can't go by how you feel. And if you want to see what you're like in the spiritual realm, you've got to hold up this word and look at it. And when it says greater works, 
than what I have done will you do because I go to the Father. You have to believe that, whether you feel it or not. And you have to start speaking. You have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. He won't flee when you talk about Jesus. He will flee from you when you use the name of Jesus and rebuke him and take authority. You have to resist the devil. You have to stand up against it. I prayed with some people tonight who just are sitting there so passive. I have people come to me all of the time and it's like they, they want to tell me how pitiful they are. You don't understand, I can't do anything. And they just spend lots of time trying to get me to feel as bad about their situation as they are, thinking that somehow or another through sympathy or pity, it will motivate me to pray for them and stuff. And my thought when I hear all of this is that you know what, you aren't resisting the devil. You are just letting the devil run smooth over you and you, you're waiting on somebody else to get it for you. You're just at, you're coming and asking me, I've prayed, it doesn't work for me, see if it'll work for you. You aren't resisting the devil. Man, you need to be fighting the devil. You need to be resisting sickness and poverty and depression and discouragement. I had somebody ask me yesterday, I think it was about, don't you ever get discouraged? And I said, I get tempted to be discouraged, but I just don't take any of the temptations. I refuse it. I could be as discouraged as anybody is. You know, I've got to have like five, I don't know, four or $5,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year just to break even. And I need more than that to prosper and do all that God told me to do. You know what, if I wanted to think about it, I could be depressed. I could be worried, I could stay up at night, but I just have chosen not to take this responsibility. The scripture says, casting all of your care over upon him because he cares for you, 1 Peter chapter five. God told us to cast our care upon him. You can't pray and say, oh God, take the care from me. You have to cast it. You do that by refusing to think on things that aren't honest and lovely and just and poor, pure, and you just focus your attention upon God. You got to do something. Man, you got to fight a battle. The battle's right here between your ears. Everybody's wanting to get out here into spiritual warfare and go to binding this and loosening to that, and they want to have spiritual warfare conferences. The battle's not up in the heavenlies. The battle's right between your ears. And there's people that will go to great effort to pray and rebuke all of this stuff, and yet they don't go to any effort to renew their mind and to change the way you think. As you think in your heart, that's the way you're gonna be. If you're depressed and discouraged, I can guarantee you, you're thinking on depressing and discouraging things. Zero exceptions. Somebody says, well, it's my hormones. It's not your hormones. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but there's just not a lot of nice ways to say this, brothers and sisters. God has provided everything for us. We're loaded. You are the victor. Satan is afraid of you. And yet most of us are living way, way, way below the standards because we just don't know what we've got. We embrace and accept defeat too easily. We see ourselves wrong. We don't see ourselves who we are in Christ. You spend too much time looking in the mirror, thinking about what you feel, and going by all of these physical, natural things instead of what the Word of God has to say about you. You know, I am living a life that is completely contrary to my natural talents and abilities. I am an introvert by nature. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. I'm doing stuff that it's impossible for me to do. And you know, if I was to go back and just indulge my natural tendency, my character traits and stuff, I could be, I could still be that way. And yet I'm just going against what I feel. I'm going by what God's word says. And I'm telling you, that's, that's how simple it is. What does God say you can do? Who does he say that you are? You find out and then you just do it whether you feel like it or not. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen have happened when I didn't feel a thing. 
I went and prayed for a woman in Chicago and this woman had only been watching me on television for a week and she had uh, stage four cancer. She was in a wheelchair. She's down to like 60 pounds. She was barely alive. She's one of the worst people I've ever seen in my life. And I tried to talk to her and she was so doped up. She had so much pain. They had her on such high medication that she would try and answer me and she would start talking and she'd fall asleep. And when her chin hit her chest, she'd jerk up and try and finish her statement. And I couldn't minister to her because she just wasn't all there. She wasn't even coherent. And the family that brought her, they had never heard me on television. They, she just made them bring her. None of them knew the word of God. None of them knew what to believe. And I, I wanted to encourage them and pray for them, but you know what? It was just too little too late. And so I didn't know what to do. She couldn't even come down to the meeting. I had to go up to the hotel room and she was just totally out of it. And so, you know what? I just said, well, in the name of Jesus, and I took my authority and rebuked the devil and commanded cancer to die. And then I walked out and I started to tell the guy that I was with that you know what, she'll die. It's just too little, too late. She's not believing God. She doesn't know how to believe God. But I learned not to speak forth something contrary to what I prayed. So I just kept my mouth shut and didn't say anything. And three months later, this woman comes running down the aisle and jumps up on the platform. And she says, do you remember me? And I didn't remember because she had gained about 40 pounds or something like that. And she said, I'm the lady in Chicago that you prayed for. And I mean, God healed her. And it, you know, I didn't feel a thing. Matter of fact, if you would have asked me, I would have said too little, too late. She's probably going to die. And yet you just do what the word of God says. You act on the word of God and God miraculously healed this woman in spite of me, not because of me. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, every one of you have the supernatural power of God on the inside of you. Every one of you have the ability to raise the dead, to cast out devils, to speak with new tongues, to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. God has given this power to every single one of you, but it's not going to work until you believe that you've got it. You're going to have to quit going by what you feel. You're going to have to quit going by what your ex said about you and the things that they cursed you with. You're going to have to quit going by what you see in the mirror or feel in your emotions. And you're just going to have to take the Word of God and go to believing what the Word of God says and step out there and do some things. Amen? You know, real quickly, I'm going to try and do this real quickly, but the thing that really changed my life, I had this encounter with the Lord where I got born again when I was eight years old, but when I was 18, God showed up and I, I don't know how it happened, but I just experienced God in a tangible way for four and a half months. I was caught up into the presence of God. And I mean, I was overwhelmed with the love of God. And it was a wonderful experience, but when that wore off, I didn't know what I did to make it happen. I didn't know what I did to make it leave. I didn't know how to get it back. And I panicked. And I spent months asking God to kill me and take me home because I figured that's the only way I could ever get back into this place to where I knew that God loved me. I could just feel his presence and tangible. I mean, it was like if I closed my eyes, I could reach out and touch him. And I didn't know how to get it back and it was desperate. And finally I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, I nearly got killed twice in one day. And I found out I really wasn't as excited about dying as I thought I was. <laughs> and so I decided that, you know what? I need to live. I don't need to be praying to die. And I didn't know I didn't know what to do. And out of desperation, I just started reading the Bible up to 10, 15 hours a day. I was in a bunker that was wallpapered with nude pictures of women. And I couldn't, you know, even put my Bible down and just look around and think. It was just like, I was like this. <laughs> 10, 12 hours a day or whatever. 
And I began to study the word and I began to get knowledge. God began to teach me things. And instead of going by just a feeling or an emotion, I began to read about who I was in Christ. And one of the verses that just transformed my life is 2 Corinthians.
the same stuff and I just could not understand. What does this mean? Because I knew I was born again. I believed that I had confessed Jesus as my Lord, but I wasn't seeing any of this. And I thought, God, this says you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. It didn't say old things are passing away. It says old things have passed away. All things have become new. And I got to saying, God, I just can't understand this. I don't see this newness in my body. I don't see it in my mind and in my emotions. And I was asking God, what does this mean? And the Lord led me to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and he's praying a prayer. And he says, I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus. And when I read that, I thought, there's a difference between spirit and soul. I had used those words interchangeably. And you'll find out that most people do. Matter of fact, the Strong's Concordance, if you look up the word pneuma, the word that's translated spirit in the Bible, it will define it as the immortal soul. It doesn't make a distinction between soul and spirit. And yet 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 made a distinction between soul and spirit. And so I got to praying about this. And anyway, it's a long story, but the Lord finally showed me that when you get born again, it's not your physical body that changes. If you were a man before you got born again, you're still gonna be a man after you get born again. If you were a woman, you'll still be a woman. If you were short, you'll still be short. If you were fat, you'll still be fat. Your body doesn't change when you get saved. Now it's been purchased and we have a promise that we are gonna get a glorified body, but your body is not redeemed yet. It's been purchased, but it's not redeemed. The payment has not been cashed in and you still have a physical, natural body. And your soul isn't the part of you that's changed because if you get born again, you still have your thoughts. You don't have my thoughts. You have your memories. You remember your childhood. You remember your family. You remember where you live. You still got the same mind and you've still got the same emotions that were programmed based upon your experiences and the way you think. Your soul doesn't change. We often use the terminology about, I'm a soul winner. And man, I came to see a soul saved. There's twice that I can think of in the Bible where it talks about like over in the book of Daniel, he that wins souls is wise. And over in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that we believe unto soul salvation. But soul salvation is not being born again. Your soul is your mind and your emotions. And when it talks about soul salvation, that's when you've been depressed and you believe God and all of a sudden you receive the joy of the Lord and you get your mind renewed, that's soul salvation. But being born again is where your spirit gets changed. That's the part of you. Just by process of elimination, you can tell it's not your soul, it's not your body that got saved, it's your spirit that got saved. And according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things passed away and all things became new. You are an absolutely brand new person in your spirit. One translation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, it's a new species of being that never existed before. That's who you are in your spirit. And this isn't something that's gonna happen in the future. It's something that's already a reality now. It says over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, herein is love, uh, herein is our, how's that go? 1 John 4, 17, anybody got that? How's that go? Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment for as he is speaking about Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. Now, is there anybody in here who's arrogant enough to believe that you in your physical body and in your soul are exactly like Jesus? Did you raise your hand? No, you aren't. You are not. Your body is not like Jesus. Jesus isn't overweight. He's not ugly. This body's gonna have to change. This body is not identical to Jesus right now. And your thoughts are not identical to Jesus. 
I can guarantee you, there are some of you thinking things about me right now that Jesus isn't thinking about me, amen. <laughs> Jesus loves me. And anyway, our thoughts aren't exactly like Jesus. So again, by process of elimination, you can tell it's not your body and it's not your soul, but it says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Do you think Jesus is depressed? Do you think Jesus is fearful? Do you think he's worried? Do you think he's lacking in any area? Do you think Jesus is sick? Do you think any of these things? No, Jesus is absolutely perfect. And the scripture says over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ, you are now a new creature. It says in Galatians chapter 4 that it was the spirit of his son that was sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. When you got born again, God put in your spirit, Jesus' spirit. You have the spirit of Christ in you. Romans chapter eight, verse nine says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you say, well, I don't think I have the, the spirit of Christ, well, then you aren't his. If you were born again, you receive the spirit of of Christ, the spirit of his son into your heart, sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. You are brand new in your spirit. It's perfect. It's exactly like Jesus. It has his mind. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16 says that we have the mind of Christ. We don't have a mind that has just been touched by Christ and is a little bit influenced. It's talking about in your spirit. You've got a mind. You've got a way of thinking in your spirit that is identical to Jesus. In your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You have his power, his anointing. If people understood this, they wouldn't ask God for, oh God, give me more faith. You've got the faith of Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter two, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He did not say by faith in the Son of God. He was living by the faith of the Son of God. God gave you his faith in your spirit. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Your spirit has faith and it is the faith of Christ. You've got the same quantity and quality of faith that Jesus had because it's his faith. He gave you his faith. And so for you to pray and say, oh God, just give me more faith. It means that you have a knowledge problem. You don't know what you got. And that's the reason that you aren't seeing your faith produce better results is because you've bought into the lie that, oh, faith works, but I just don't have much of it. God, give me more faith. You've already believed a lie. You don't know who you are. Again, I go back to that verse I used earlier, Philippians chapter, or Philemon chapter one, verse six, he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual, that means it would begin to work, by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Notice how your faith begins to work. It isn't by praying for more, asking God for more, praying, fasting, doing better, living holier or anything. It comes by acknowledging what you already have. The word acknowledge, that's not asking for something. That's just acknowledging what you already have. It has to do with knowledge. We've already got everything. God has already given you everything that you need. Did you know when you need wisdom, it says in James chapter one, verse five, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You gotta believe that God has given you wisdom. And actually, if you look in Ephesians chapter one, I'm not gonna take time to turn over to these verses, but it says he's already abounded towards us in all wisdom and in all prudence. It says that you have the mind of Christ, first John chapter two, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. 
Most people, they go look at their last test score and they think, I don't know all things. This is proof. You couldn't find your glasses today and they were on top of your head. You couldn't find your car keys and people just say, well, I don't know all things. The Bible says you know all things. Which is it? It's both. In your spirit, you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. But with your little peanut sized brain, we don't know everything. This isn't talking about your natural mind, but in the spirit, you've got the mind of Christ. And man, I, I could spend an hour on this. I'm saying so much stuff here tonight. But in your spirit, you've got the mind of Christ. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, that when you pray in tongues, your spirit prays. What's it praying? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter two, the hidden wisdom of God. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, that if any man prays in tongues, let him pray also that he may interpret. So you know what, when you need wisdom, all you gotta do is say, Father, thank you that I've already got the mind of Christ. I've got an unction from the Holy One and I know all things, all things that is praying. And so I'm gonna pray forth the hidden wisdom of God and I am gonna ask you for an interpretation. And it's just like you got this well here with all this life-giving water, but you could die of thirst if you can't draw it out. So you stick a bucket down in there and you draw it up. When you speak in tongues, it's your spirit praying this hidden wisdom of God. You're drawing this wisdom out. I mean, all you gotta do is, is ask for an interpretation and God will show you what to do. I know some of you think that's too simple. That's the way it works. I have had God show me thousands and thousands of things when I didn't know what to do with my natural mind. I just believed that in my spirit, I already had the answer and I would start speaking in tongues and then ask God for an interpretation and boom, like this, God would just show me what to do. I mean, things that once you see it, it's so obvious you wonder how you couldn't do it. But the carnal mind, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural mind, talking about your carnal mind, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Or excuse me, that was from Romans chapter 8, but that was a great verse too. <laughs> the carnal mind is not subject to God, neither indeed can be. But over in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, what does it say? Put that up there again. <laughs> Got sidetracked. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You cannot relate to God with just your carnal understanding. You have to operate out of your spirit. Man, this is why it is so important that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you speak in tongues. And there are people right in this room that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and can speak in tongues, but you don't do it very often. And you'll be sitting here praying and saying, oh God, what do I do? And the whole time you've got this well of living water on the inside of you and you're dying of thirst because you didn't stick the bucket down in there. You didn't start praying in tongues and draw it out. Man, anytime you need wisdom, all you gotta do is start praying in tongues and then say, Father, uh, give me an interpretation. Show me what I'm doing. Some of you have heard me give this illustration, but when we moved into our Elton office, not the one, not the new one that we just built, but a previous one, I needed $3.2 million. And at that time, at the rate money was coming in, I sat down and figured it out. It would have taken me over $100 at the rate we were saving money to save $3.2 million. And so I went to get a loan and for nine months, they told me that you have the loan, you're approved, we'll get your money next week. And that went on for nine months. And after nine months, they finally said, you know, it's been so long since we got the appraisal. We need a new appraisal. Let's just start all over. And man, our Bible college was just, it was being choked to death. We didn't have room, but for a hundred students in there. And we had to put porta potties outside and the men in the winter would go out in the snow and use the porta potties. We just, we couldn't accommodate any more people. I needed that money then. And so I told this guy, I said, no way am I gonna start this thing over and go another nine months. I said, you let me pray. And I started praying in tongues 
And I didn't walk hardly any further than from here to that wall over there. And I said, Father, I need an answer. I know in my spirit, I've got the knowledge, the mind of Christ. I'm asking for an interpretation. And before I got any further than that, the Lord reminded me of a prophecy. And it says that you don't need a bank because you have your own bank. And, and it went on to say that that's your partners. Your partners are going to do this and you'll be able to build, <clears throat> build everything debt free. And I had forgotten it. I got busy doing other things and I had forgotten this for, and when, when I had that thought come to me, I thought, could this be the reason that this loan isn't working out? It's because God doesn't want me to get a loan. And as I thought about it, I wasn't going to say that's what I was going to do and then change later on if it didn't work out. If I made a commitment to do this debt free, you know, the Bible says that a righteous man will, or a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. And if I said I was going to do it debt free, I was going to do it debt free. And like I had said, at the rate money was coming in, it would have taken me a hundred years without a miracle from God to save $3.2 million. If I would have been gone. I'd have been dead. My vision for Karis Bible College would have never come to pass. And so it was a big deal. And man, I prayed about it to make sure, but the more I prayed about it, I just knew that that's what God spoke to me. I knew it was right. And so I told the guy that ran our ministry, I said, this is my decision. We're going to do this debt free. I will not borrow any money. And if they come to me and offer me all of the money that I've asked for tomorrow, I won't accept it. We're going to do this debt free. Guess what? The next day they came and said, instead of 3.2, we're going to loan you $4 million. And I said, too late. And we turned it down. And in 14 months, we had that $3.2 million and we moved into that building and it worked. But that's how that happened, was believing these things. God says that you've got an unction. You know all things. You've got the mind of Christ. You don't need any man to teach you, but that anointing will teach you all things. In my natural, I thought, no, that's not true. I don't know. And I searched my carnal mind and I, the answer wasn't there. But then I believe what the word said, that when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying in the spirit and that I can pray that I interpret. And I just act on what the word says and this supernatural ability on the inside comes out. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Thousands and thousands of times. And if you're born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have this same thing. And yet how many people stumble through life not having an assurance that God has spoken to them that they're doing things. They're just hoping that it's working. You're leaning under your own understanding. That's like a blind person just going along. And it's just a matter of time until you are going to trip. You're going to fall. You're, something's going to happen to you. Man, you need to open up your eyes. We got all of these things. We got this wisdom from God, and yet most people, most Christians aren't using it. When I teach on the knowledge of God and the uh, the will of God, and that God has a plan for every person, usually I'll give an invitation at the end and ask those who aren't sure. They don't know for sure what God's told them to do. They're just kind of like a pinball. You got launched and you're just bouncing off things. This didn't work, so you do this, and you're just boing, boing, boing around. You don't have any, you don't have any control. Life has just pushed you in this direction. And after I teach on stuff like that, I'll ask how many of you don't know for sure. And it's not unusual out of, out of a group like this, spirit-filled Christians, to have 80, 90% of the people stand and say that they don't know for sure that they're doing what God called them to do. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I have compassion for you, but that is inexcusable. It is absolutely. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, don't be ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. God wants you to know his will. You can't accomplish God's will accidentally. You've got to have a goal. If you don't pursue it, you won't get it. You've got to know what God has called you to do. And you've got to move in that direction. And most people, well, how do I do that? By taking the things that I've been talking about, believing that God has already placed all this on the inside of you and you stick your nose in the Bible. You start learning how the kingdom works. You start unlocking these things. You pray in tongues and ask for an interpretation. And I tell you, you do this. God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. 
He wants to reveal himself to you. God wants to use you. God wants to make your life so awesome that when you wake up in the morning, that you are just so excited about the day instead of pulling the covers over your head and wishing that you could go back to sleep. Man, you ought to be excited about the day. You ought to be excited about where your life is going. Instead of saying, oh, Jesus, come back because I'm just about to give up. And you're, you're praying for the rapture so that you can escape. Man, you ought to be so excited that God, I'm, I'm looking for you to come back. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But man, I'm so excited about what God's doing that I could, I, if he tarries, awesome. Amen. Because I got a lot to do. I got a lot of things that he's shown me. You ought to be excited about your life. Brothers and sisters, God loves you. God has done everything for you. It's not God's fault that we aren't experiencing these things. He's put this on the inside of us, but the word of God is how you unlock it. It's how you draw this stuff out. And it's just our ignorance. People are perishing for our lack of knowledge. We've got to renew our mind. You've got to get in and find out who you are. My personal testimony is that when I begin to understand these things, I mean, I came alive. To think that I didn't have to just pray and then sit back and wait on God to do something, that he had already put this power on the inside of me. It's not me waiting on God. God's waiting on me. God's waiting on me to stir myself up, to take the word and renew my mind and stand up and do something. Man, when I found these things out, it just made me come alive. I began to start believing for healing. I started seeing miracles happen. We started doing all kinds of things. And I'm telling you, the body of Christ has not been taught who they are in Christ and what he's done for them. Instead, we've been taught that God can do anything. He has done nothing, but he could do it. And if you would pray hard enough, and if you will live holy enough, and if you will do things just right, maybe God will move. And that's how the average person is seeking for God's power and demonstration in their life. But the truth is you've already got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. You can't get any more of God. You can't get any more faith. You can't get any more knowledge, any more wisdom. You've already got these things. You just have to draw it out through the renewing. You know, we were at the Bible college today and we heard great testimonies. I didn't really minister. I just sat and listened to them give their testimonies. And it was awesome. It was awesome to hear them talk about the way that their life was changed. And the thing that changed every single person was just finding out the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The truth is what makes you free. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. It's the word. It's the truth of God's word that sets you free. And it's only the truth you know that sets you free. What you don't know isn't setting you free. You've got to renew your mind. And these students were just talking about how they've learned the Word of God. Arthur was ministering in the school twi uh, two days already this week, and I heard a number of testimonies about guilt-free living, and it just set people free. And they didn't get something new from God. It was just discerning to our discovering what they already had, what Jesus had already provided. Man, I just wish somehow or another I could open up your brain and pour this stuff into you, but that's not how it happens. You can't do it by just laying hands on you. You know, I've got, I've got friends in ministry that they, they, are, uh, they come along and they lay hands on people and this friend of mine, Dave Duell, some of you know him. I know Dan and Nancy Thompson are real uh, closely associated with him. But Dave and I used to go to uh, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan twice a year and hold meetings in this church of about 1,000 people. And we had what we called show and tell. And I would get up and tell about how to receive and stuff. And then after I preached, Dave would come up 
and start praying for people. And Dave operates in the supernatural and he blows on people, spits on people. He just does all kinds of weird stuff. And people would receive. And I mean, it was just miraculous. And I'd be sitting up here on the platform thinking, of, and you know, I'd have people that had been partners with me for 10 years and didn't receive their healings and were still struggling. And David come along and blow on them and they'd get healed. <laughs> and I'd just sit there and think, what's going on here? But about half of the people Dave prayed for after they got up off the floor, they'd go away with the same problem. And so they, I'd have people come and talk to me and I'd sit there and tell them, I said, you know, you've already got it. God's already healed you. You take your authority, death and life are in the power of the tongue and I'd teach them. And anyway, the point I'm getting across is it's not one or the other. There were people that I had ministered to and they never got it through just the renewing of their mind. And so they needed somebody to come along who says, I've got the anointing on me. And they would put faith in his anointing and believe that when he prayed for them and they'd get it. But then there was others that the only way they would receive is to renew their mind and learn these things. And so God has used, and there have been these gifts that have special anointings and they come along and they, they build an atmosphere and say, the spirit of God is here. Anything is possible right now. For the next 15 minutes, God is here. And there's people that will receive that way. And I'm not against that. But you know what? You can't take that home with you. You can take the word of God home with you. I believe that the reason God uses gifts of the spirit in different ways to reach people is because if the only way you could receive from God was through the renewing of your mind and if you have a terminal illness and you've only got a week to live and yet it's gonna take a year for you to renew your mind, that would just mean that you have to die, that there's no hope for you. So God gave these special gifts to the body and praise God for it. Man, if you, you know, need a healing or something and you've done all you know to do, I, there's nothing wrong with you going and seeking out somebody that has a supernatural gift. But God never intended for the body of Christ to become dependent upon that and that to be the only way that they ever receive from God. God wants you to learn who you are and what you have so that you can just walk in healing and victory and joy and peace and prosperity on your own by the renewing of your mind. I believe that that's a stopgap measure to get you to a place to where you can receive directly from God. But sadly, the body of Christ only knows how to receive by praying, calling the prayer chain, getting a hundred people to pray and just call down the power of God and ask God to pour out his spirit. I tell you, a better way is like uh, Jesus told a number of people. He says, your faith made you whole. It wasn't his faith. They took the things that he was sharing with them about God and they believed and their faith made them whole. That's the person in Mark, Matthew chapter eight that he says, I've never found so great faith. A faith that just believed what the word of God had to say and they didn't go by what they felt like. He said, I don't need to see you come into my house. I don't need you to lay your hand upon my servant. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus marveled and said, this is the greatest faith I've ever seen. So praise God. I believe God will use all kinds of things to reach us, but I'm trying to say tonight that God has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. It's through the renewing of your mind that you experience the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And brothers and sisters, we just have to start taking responsibility to renew our mind, to quit listening to the doubt and the unbelief of this world. Quit being plugged into the world. You know, there's a lot of people in this room right now that you watch the exact same stuff that unbelievers watch, you read the same stuff, you listen to the same music, you hear the same news, you get all of the same information, and yet you want different results than what others have. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are gonna have to unplug from the world. You are gonna have to quit thinking the thoughts that have produced all of the problems in you, and you're gonna have to get into the Word of God. 
And there's a lot of people that just aren't willing to go that far. Well, you better find somebody that's anointed and just move in with them. <laughs> Follow them around because you aren't going to get it by the renewing of your mind. And you're going to be dependent upon having somebody else come and pray for you. And I tell you, that's hit and miss. And you aren't going to be able to walk in constant victory. But if you want to live in an absolute victorious life, it all comes through the renewing of your mind, through the knowledge that God has given you. You need to take your authority and you need to start resisting the devil and he'll flee from you. And you do these things. And I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, you can walk in victory. It's really that simple. It's not easy what I've ministered tonight. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is get away from the knowledge of good and evil. That's what Satan tempted Eve with, feeling like she didn't know something. She was missing out on something. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is unplug from this world and not find out who won Dancing with the Stars <laughs> and who won the Super Bowl and all of this stuff. I mean, that, those are really big deals, big things. You know, I've just missed 46 years worth of American history and society. I don't even know. They were talking about somebody today that they were listening to somebody and I said, are they a singer? I'd never heard of them and they, they, they were polite to me, but yeah, they're a singer and I, I'm the only one in here that wouldn't know who they are. I've missed out on a lot of stuff. I've missed out on a lot of doubt and unbelief and fear and bitterness and hurt. I haven't been depressed in 46 years. I've seen my son raised from the dead, my wife raised from the dead. I've seen multiple people raised from the dead. I've seen God supply needs and I've missed a lot. I really have. I, and if we play Trivial Pursuit, I'm just dead. I don't know all of this stuff. Amen. But I'm telling you, you just, you, you're going to have to focus on God. So it's as easy as what I've said, but it is difficult. It's as simple as what I've said, but it's, it's difficult to just unplug. You'll feel like you're missing out on all of this stuff. But I tell you, it's well worth it. Man, the results. I don't, I don't mind missing out on the trivial pursuit and being just dead weight. Praise God. I used to play Trivial Pursuit with my in-laws. Every time we'd go over and see them, all of the boys would play against the girls. And I'd just sit there for an hour or two and say nothing. Unless it was, you know, something like uh, science or geography. I know those things. But I mean, basically, I'd just sit there and not have anything. And one time, I just was feeling like I... I I need to answer a question. And so I was believing God. And I asked God for a word of knowledge. I said, I'm going to get this next one in the name of Jesus. And so the question was, what magazine debuted April the 1st, 1950, I forgot now, 53 or something. And I knew it was Playboy. And that's the only question I answered all night long. <laughs> and they said, sure, we can tell what you've been doing. I said, honest, it was a word of knowledge. I just, God gave it to me and I, I got that one, praise God. But man, I have to use the gift of the spirit to play these games with people. Praise God. I wish I could, I, I wish some, I wished I had the words to be able to try and impress on you how powerful the word of God is, how important it is to renew your mind. I've been trying to share that with you tonight and I, I know many of you will walk right out of here and go back to exactly the same thinking that you've been having. You won't put any more effort into renewing your mind than you have in the past and you'll just walk out of here like, like I didn't even share anything with you.
Thank you.